Hey everyone, Born to Run coach and author Eric Orton here. Welcome to the Cool Impossible Running Show, where we dream beyond fear and run beyond limits. Taking a deep dive into coaching, training, racing, and adventure that will help you accomplish your Cool Impossible. Episode number one. Here we go. Why are we doing this? Well, I got a question from Troy, who's a longtime follower of the channel. And one of his questions started with a statement of, he talked about how my videos had helped him bump up in distance to the hundred to, to the 200 mile distance and how successful he was in making that transition. And he specifically wanted to know about when to hike. When is it appropriate to hike versus run? And it got me thinking maybe it's time to do a deep dive running show that really gets into training, racing, adventure, coaching. And that's what this is going to be about. And we're going to dive into the 200 mile distance today, but with the idea that this is going to help anybody bump up into any distance and just give you things to think about. So I want you to think of your questions as you're listening and watching this and send your questions down below, because as I've mentioned in my other videos, that really helps me get inside your brain of what what kind of mindset you have, and it'll help us to make um, future episodes. So I use that word us, and that segues into me introducing my co-host, Margo Waters. Welcome, Margo. Thank you. I'm and very excited. Those, yeah, me too. This is going to be fun. Um, so for those of you who've read my books, Born to Run 2, in the cool impossible, you'll recognize Margot's name. She was featured in both, and the reason why I wanted her to come on as a co-host is for a few reasons. One, we have been coaching together for almost twenty years, so she's the longest athlete that I've worked with, and she has pretty much done and raced every endurance race distance out there you can do up to two hundred miles. So all of you watchers out there are going to really resonate with Margo. She's a mother of five. She lives on a farm and she's a master's athlete and she's gotten better as she's gotten older. So there's really Margo's the full package of, of what I feel can resonate with so many people out there. And that's, that's why I wanted her to come on and be the co-host. And so Margo kind of just, um, we're, we're in this first episode, we're going to kind of maybe do a little bit longer intro for Margo. So just be, people can be introduced to her. So, um, Margo lives in Victor, Idaho, which if you've ever been to Jackson hole, where I'm from, Victor, Idaho is up and over Teton pass that drops you down into Idaho. So Margo, you live on a farm, paint the picture. What's Victor, Idaho like? Uh, it's a very small town, not like Jackson. When we first moved here, there was about 750 people, no stoplight through our town. We do have a stoplight and uh, now, and we're probably up to like 1,500 people. Um, I love it. It's um, all about the outdoors. Everybody here who lives here likes the outdoors in some capacity, or you don't live here. Um, and um, yeah, we're... I'm pre- we're, we're not self-sufficient, but um, I'm a big gardener, um, so I do a lot of my vegetables, and um, we re- have raised everything from meat chickens to lambs to um, regular chickens, lame chickens, and we've had goats, and um, yeah, it's it's fun. Right now, I have a couple horses, three horses, two miniature donkeys, which one of them is hopefully going to be um, one of my next cool impossibles, which is the uh, burrow race up in Leadville. Um, and they're just becoming of age. And then, uh, yeah, I just got a new puppy, a little, uh, I have three dogs, a little puppy I just got. And uh, oh, could the list of animals could go on and on. <laughs> yeah. So, so again, for those of you who are familiar with the Tetons, Jackson Hole is just east of the Teton range and Victor, Idaho is just west of the Teton range. So we're basically on either side of the Tetons. 
um, to give you kind of okay. a geographical frame of reference. So kind of talk about, I mentioned, you know, you've raced every distance that I can think of to do. Um, what, 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 just talk us, talk, talk us through your race bio and, and some of the things you, you've done. Just, you know, you can kind of start with the triathlon stuff and just kind of give people an overview of, of what you've really done in the last 20 years. Yeah, so uh, Eric and I started um, with a triathlon with an Ironman, Coeur d'Alene. And I think you coached me through a few of those Ironmans. I think I did seven total. And then I switched to the half Ironman and found that I love that because it was a little bit faster. And um, I don't know, there were, I, there was there, I love the courses on the half. So I did those for quite a few years and kept looking at the mountains and kept saying, <laughs> why am I not in the mountains and why am I on road in, in the swimming pool? And so you and I, we kind of switched slowly. I did, I think I started with just some local small races um then moved to 50k the bighorn which was my absolute favorite race um it challenged me every single time um i love that race and then i've done everything from um uh, you know the north face in in san francisco to um i was a the utah master championship in uh outside of Salt Lake one year. And that was the 100K um, distance, right? That was 100K. That was my first 100K. Um, and just kind of went into it. And like I do, as Eric knows, with everything, um, no, you know, I just, I love the challenge of a, something new. And so um, that was my first 100K. And then I did a couple, um, and then I got into stage racing because I wanted... I thought that would be fun. I love to camp. So stage racing <laughs> has um, camp because I camp at a lot of my races. So stage racing um, was a great way to cover a lot of a lot of distance, 150 miles, most stage races. Um, and and you've, you've traveled to those, days. right? One Madagascar and then Patagonia, oh. right? Yeah, Madagascar was a huge, cool, impossible. Um, my my husband did not know what to think about that one <laughs> but uh yeah i went to madagascar and um i had chile and Patago you know chile and argentina was the patagonia one and um and what was the loved... what was the one in utah oh the grand de grand i'm sure many of your of your uh um followers probably know the grand de grand it's gotten very popular right. i did it in one of its first years um fantastic slot canyons um, but you carry everything on your back except for water and a tent, but you carry everything else for, um, oh God, is it five days? I think it's five days. Um, so that is, I love the challenge of being self-sufficient out there, which kind of led me to some of my bigger races in Europe, because in Europe, you, uh, they, you don't, you're not allowed to have any support on the race. Um, they have aid stations and stuff, but you don't have pacers, but you're kind of self-sufficient. And, um, I so really to, kind of to, to, gravitated Take us, take to us that. through the Europe races. What, what, what races have you done in Europe? So I found Mount Rosa, which is a hundred K, which runs like a hundred mile. And the first year, it was the first year they were doing it. And I, I remember, um, it was Liz Hawkins. Is that right? Is that her name? Hawker. British Hawker. Yeah. She, um, it was, you had to be invited or you had to apply because she was just testing it out. And now it's, it's a, it's every year. Um, so I did that race and that was my first experience of the big mountain Alps. And, um, it was, it brought me to my knees literally. Um, but it gave me the itch to get back there. And then I, uh, I got into the Tour de Giants, which is the one we're going to talk about today, um, which um, if people don't yeah, know we'll, we'll that, get into the specifics of, of okay. that. So then, 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 and then, then TDS, right? And then I right? did TDS. Yeah. So I tended to go to the big mountain technical um, hard races. Okay. So for... I know I, I know you don't like to talk about yourself, but I'm going to bring it out in you. So let's go back to triathlon real quick. Is that... Talk to us about some of your results in triathlon and at what age did you make, make the jump to ultra running? 
the claim to fame for my Ironmans yeah. was the, um, when working with you, I had an injury that was like a 20 year old injury, but it um, brought me back to basics. And with a cast on, we started, you know, training. And eight months later, um, I qualified for the um, half world Ironman um, world champions. And that was huge um for me i was like wow i can do this <laughs> and it wasn't and that I, don't, don't didn't you feel like that was okay hey I, I really kind of accomplished what i wanted to with triathlon and that was kind of the springboard into getting on mountains and and sticking with on foot yep yep that was it once i once i, I did i also wanted to i did the it um you long distance triathlon I wanted to race for the U.S. I thought that would be kind of a fun thing to do. So I qualified for that, and I did that one also. So after those two big things, I moved to trail racing at 46. Right. That's how old I was when I started trail racing. <laughs> okay, and, and so um, just we'll, we'll wrap this up. Just walk us through some of your results starting at age 40. Um, uh, at age 40 or right, I have 46. Um, sorry. 46, sorry. I was gonna I'm, say. I'm trying to make uh, you younger. Right. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of like Monument Valley hundred K. I was a fourth female, um, in that ultra and ultra Mount Rosa. When I was 50, I was a seventh female. Um, when, um, gosh, my first win what about was Bighorn? in Pocahontas. Oh, oh, Bighorn. I have fourth. My best result is fourth overall at 48 yeah. years old. Um, so, and then I was the, uh, I was a Utah master champion at, um, 49. So that, that masters starts at 40, not 50. And it was like a 40 year old Got masters. It. Right. So. And yeah. then walk, walk us through real quickly TDS and tour giants results. So the, Tour to Giants, I was a 17th woman overall. Um, I was a second U.S. woman, which I was proud of. I don't know how many women were from the U.S. And then TDS, I was um, third in my age group. Um, that's it. I mean, there's thousands of people in that race. So um, I don't know what I, I don't know where I was female wise, but being third in my age group, as it's a master's again. Right. It was, that was a big deal for me. That was a highlight. Podium, podium. So it was a big, it was a big podium. <laughs> First race from the United States, Fargo Waters. The idea being not that results matter. My point yeah. with making her walk us through all these great results is that to make you help, help you maybe understand that really age is a number. We hear that and there's always a way to get better. There's always something that we can do to make you better as we get older, especially if you're looking to increase the distance. And that kind of pulls us into what we're going to take a deep dive, a deep, cool, impossible dive today into the 200 mile distance that will resonate in any type of distance you're moving up to. So kind of the, the 200 miles becoming a little bit more popular. There's a race series here in in the States and what we're going to really specifically dive into is the tour of giants, which is over in Italy, which is Margot's big, big race that she did with 200 mile race and kind of um, walk us through, paint the picture of what tour of giants is really all about. And we have some cool data that we're going to compare this race with other popular races that you may have heard of, but Margot, yeah. Tell it, tell us what tour of giants is all about. Yeah, so first of all, it's a celebration of the the Aosta Valley, and we're not saying the name right. I did tour. To, I call it Tour de Giants too. Yeah, Tour de Giants. Yeah. Giants or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So it's basically it's their celebration, and you basically it's a um, hundred thousand feet vertical. You're going over twenty five mountain passes. Um, you go through thirty four municipalities, so like towns. Um, there, um, I mean, the 25 mountain passes, that's kind of a, a biggie. Um, there's, uh, every 50 K. So I think, um, there's seven, uh, there's a life station. They call them life stations. Um, 
and that is where you get a bag. You can get your bag. So every 50 K you got your bag. And yeah, it was, it took me 150 hours on 10 hours of sleep. Um, and about half the people finished that race. So to put this into perspective, a hundred thousand feet of vertical gain in 200 miles. Let's, let's take some of the 200 milers here in the States. The Moab 240 averages 120 feet per mile. Tahoe 200 averages 170 feet gain per mile. Western States 100 averages 180 feet gain per mile. Hard Rock averages 331 feet gain per mile. UTMB averages 320 feet per mile. Tour of Giants averages 500 feet gain per mile for 200 miles. So that puts in a perspective of what type of race we're talking about. And so we're going to the extreme because it's always easier to work backwards and talk about all the other races that you might want to do for your cool impossible. Um, that it, it's always easier to work backwards that way from a perspective and all my athletes understand how important I feel perspective is. So even just start thinking about what you're gaining per mile while you're out on training, rather than thinking about the total game, you really want to know what, what that feet per mile is that you're averaging. So then you can look at what you're doing in training for every mile on average relative to the race that you're choosing to do. And that really went into what Margo and I did from a coaching perspective for all her specific types of training. We needed to get her legs used to 500 feet of, of foot of gain per mile. Okay. And so that kind of takes us to, you know, I think a lot of people have that question of, okay, what, what does my training need to look like? Or how does my training need to change if I bump up to the ultra marathon distance of a 50 K or a 50 mile or to the hundred mile or in, and beyond. And if really you're used to marathon training, it really comes down to what you have time for versus what really needs to change. And Margo did a whole lot change for us in general of what you were doing when you went up to that 200 mile distance from say the 50 to 100 K hundred mile distance. Um, I wouldn't say a whole lot of change, but I would say, <clears throat> now let, let me back up you could... you know, the, the specific things that we do changes, but what you're doing in general was not a huge jump up in total training volume. Right. 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 Because there's no way as most people could, I mean, like I would like to say that the thing about training, you know, racing and training is just a, a part of my daily life. You know, I have, you know, it's not my, it doesn't over consume me. And that is, I think, don't ever let it over consume you because then you have to have that balance. Otherwise you're going to burn out or get hurt or, you know, it's so, yeah. So no, my training, yes, there was days of really hard that we've talked about. Um, there's times that it was different, but um, in general, very, very similar. And, and so again, what changes is the specific aspects we do for any type of race. You know, if, if you're doing a marathon, the specific aspects of marathon training is doing marathon pace runs, right? Whereas something that's very specific to going to Tour Giants for 200 miles is doing a lot of vertical in the mountains. So the overall right, time necessarily didn't change. So right. if, if if we look back at your triathlon and making that jump from triathlon to ultra distance, what would you recommend to people to start to think about when they do think they want to up, up the distance in racing, whether it's to that 50 K or 50 miles, or maybe they're already at 50 miles. And what's that jump going to be like to a hundred miles? I, first of all, I would say always, go for it. That's my, my thing. I don't care where you live. If you live in Florida or whatever, I think that you can speak to, um, there's ways to train, um, for any type of race. Um, 
or any distance, but, um, so I didn't let, I didn't let that stop me. Um, but we are lucky because I live in an area that has a lot of, a lot of mountains to train in, but, um, I know many of the people I met on races, they did not, and they were doing great. Um, it's really about understanding what you can do in training to help you mimic where you live. Read so, race reports. Let, yeah. So, <laughs> right. So let, let's, let's dive, let's dive into some of the training. So, you know, it, you're, you're coming into 200 mile distance from a 50 mile, a hundred K a hundred mile distance. And you live in the Tetons, you live in the mountains, you've done, you know, we've done mountain training for those other races because those were challenging courses in itself. What really changed for you that was very specific to Tour Giants? I think the biggest difference is incorporating um, steep hikes into my training. Um, we tended to use um, the ski mountains um, and not, you know how everybody had, they have the um, switchbacks that um, go up those mountains. I would go straight up, just right up the middle um, and do a lot of vertical straight up because that mimicked more of the style of Tour de Giants. I mean, yeah, they had switchbacks, but it was very steep. Um, so that was one thing we did. Um, and, and, and with that, I think it's important to note that when we're doing specific stuff like this, when you're trying to design your seasonal program, when you're doing very specific work that's specific to the race, you want that relatively close to the race. So three, three months out, you don't want to start doing this early on. Okay. So, um, yeah, car carry on. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I would, a question for you is, um, we continue to do speed work, um, and track work and other type type of work that I would say maybe didn't, I didn't see the connection. So if you could. Well, I, I think you, you, th that's very important. And that's on my list to talk about is that why, why continuing to work on speed and turnover is so, so important for ultra runners in general. Um, but even something that's as, as different as, as the specific vertical training that you did. And, you know, now looking back, can you see how important that was? Well, yeah, as well as like short little um, 20 second vertical sprints and then walk down 20, you know, just the short little um, sprints, not necessarily doing long slugging, walking, you know, tr training. We did a lot of very short, hard. Yeah. yeah. And that's training. just keeping your strength in. It's improving your force. So you have better force to apply to the more specific types of running that you're going to be doing for that race. So it's, 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 you know, strength training 101, you do that to improve your overall strength endurance. And I think that's, what's missed with a lot of endurance athletes is that they, they go right to doing the long hill repeats or the, the long track workouts where they miss out on the short stuff. And that's, that's the development. That's the foundation that then leads to better strength and speed endurance. So we, we did that early on and maintained it to one, also keep your leg turnover that again, will help race pace, just feel a little bit easier and maintaining a better cadence for those mountain, um, those, those straight up mountains. So. Yeah, and then I would say the other thing we worked a lot on, and I think people don't realize, is the downhill. Um, you 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 train for downhill. Downhill downhill it doesn't just come, <laughs> and I'm sure people know that after racing and like they're, but like I your method of training for downhill, like it really, um, I didn't have problems. I mean, with the I mean, I love downhill. Um, well, and I, I so really you can wanted... talk to how we train that. Yeah, I mean, we really need to dive into this because, again, I think, you know, I mentioned it with all my videos on on the regular channel, but training for the downhill is so, so important for strength, but it also goes into race strategy, which we'll talk about later. 
But you know, you can remember some of those days where I had you hike up 4,000 feet of climbing and then run down because right. that's so good strength. But the, where it's going to make and break your race in any type of hilly ultra is being able to run well downhill versus using the downhill as recovery because you made the uphill too hard. And that's one of the most common mistakes I see people make again, in any distance or any ultra, is that they focus so much on the uphill, either through their effort, and they don't realize now is the time to make up time on the downhill, or they, their uphill is so hard that they have to walk or re get recovery downhill when now they can make up two, three, four minutes per mile. Um, and that 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 just feeds on itself and is a cumulative process. So um, that, that's, that's just a huge strategy for any type of, any type of distance. And because downhill running is so important, so potent strength and very important for race strategy, it, I think it's important for listeners to know that early on, we are so, so dialed into working on your form running downhill and how important have it still having a four foot strike and, and gaining that type of muscle memory. So every step is a form of strength training. Walk us through why I was so anal about that and how you became such a good downhiller um, and, and how important foot strike is. In general, foot strike is huge. Um, I think it's kind of like uh, people who don't know how to ski until later in life. Like you want to lean back when you um, yeah. ski. Well, the same thing kind of people running downhill, especially steep downhill. Um, so we practice, you can actually foot strike going the same way, whether you want to speed it up or go maintain the same. It's the same foot strike. So, which is, I always thought was super fun to, to learn is that so you don't necessarily as you're going big you don't necessarily have, have to go really long you continue to rotate your feet or whatever you want to say foot strike um at the same pace whether you want to you know keep it at a slower pace going down or just haul ass down um and i think uh, that's I mean, that's the key is that through practice and through perfection of this mastery craft of running downhill which i think it is then you, you can have this good form, like you mentioned, at any type of speed. And that's that's really the holy grail is that if you can run as fast as you need to without heel striking, your body is going to reap the rewards later in the race. So Right. And if so, you're not putting your brakes on, you're not you're not hurting your quads because yeah. you're you don't want to be putting the brakes on you. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So and it's 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 what you're doing most of the time in training to let this muscle memory take hold and it takes practice. So early in the season is when I have my athletes work on this is all they're doing is running easy downhill, working on their craft of downhill with good foot strike. And as they progress through the season and they get closer and closer to specific training, they become better and better and better at it. So then we can speed up a little bit or do longer downhills and they have that muscle memory to really reap the rewards of that strength. So, yeah, real quickly, I know we're going to transition, but a good yeah. advice that you always gave us or gave me is I picked a section of trail that was easy that I, that, and I just would repeat that even knowing the section is a good way to work and it, it was rocky or whatever, but pick a little section and get comfortable with it going downhill. And that's a good way to, and early on to, and that, you know, that's gain, great because gain confidence. That that translates too. If you're doing it over and over and over, your brain is learning, and it's seeing the rocks and where, where to foot put your foot, and and you doing it over and over and over, you get better and better and better at it, and that translates for your brain when you go to foreign terrain. It's going to recognize and remember what you've done, and you'll be able to do that in in foreign or new terrain. So that's a great point. So, yeah. all right, let's dive into the race. So. Race strategy. Now that we're talking about hills, I, I believe we broke this race up into what seven 50k sections, right? Correct. Mentally? Correct. And so our, our general um race strategy for in training that led us to the race was really to hike steady, hike the uphills, have that strength, have your practice with your poles for the uphills but then really be able to run as much as possible downhill 
throughout the entire race. So what walk us through kind of how the physical strategy worked um, leading up to that last 50 K. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, poles, poles were a big one um, because I mean, I actually use them downhill too. Um, but being confident and using poles properly. Um, I see people, a lot of people out there, just they're in their hands and they're not actually using them, but they're a huge advantage for uphill because it makes you go faster. If you watch the Europeans, they're very good with poles. How do poles. you use the poles on the downhill to help you? Um, kind of, um, if you, I would say like skiers, if you're a skier by planting you, it just kind of, it keeps you, you're, you looking for out, you know, like not necessarily at your feet. You're kind of looking downhill, um, which you should do. Um, you don't want to be just looking right at your feet. You want to be kind of looking a couple feet out. And so poles are really good to help, um, just keep your balance as you're cruising downhill. And now with this style of race where there really wasn't a decision whether to run or hike uphill, it was basically just hike uphill. There's yeah. other races where we've really worked on strategy of always reading the terrain. And when, when it's more of a rolly course or not as hilly and as much vertical as this race, I see another common mistake athletes make is that once they decide to hike, they just maintain that hike versus re always continuously reading the terrain and making moment to moment decisions, whether to hike or run. Walk us just through your overall you know, race experience of how, how you can make those decisions, whether to hike or run. Well, one of the things we did was obviously heart rate, which is, was a big factor to me, but um, somebody told me one time hike with purpose. So I think a lot of people get lulled into a hike and um, are just hiking to hike. I always mentally in my brain was hiking with a purpose. So, you know, it, it was not a casual hike. And then when you just, when you crest or when you're about to crest, you know, anytime I could run or I felt the run was not a huge effort, um, then I would be running. Um, and that, that um, could be the case, even though you have a big climb, you might have little dips within that climb and you might take four or five steps of running and then back into a hike again, right? Where you're right. always, and always that, reading that terrain. And that is, I would say that takes, that is very exhausting. That type of a course is incredibly exhausting. Yep. Um, that going from a run to a hike, that's kind of, to be honest with you, I feel like I'm almost cheating when I do these big mountains because they're, this, they're vertical for miles and miles and you are just hiking. But the courses that do have the, um, it, it takes practice because you, yeah, they, they could be, get back they could into be more run. taxing mentally and physically because it's hard you're, to get into a having, run. Yeah, you don't, you're, you're always changing things up. Um, but yeah. the point being is learn to read the terrain. And when Correct. you can go a little bit faster by running for top five, 10 steps, go for it and then back into a hike. It's not just one decision and sticking with it. And then how, how did the downhills go for you at, at Tour Giants? They went incredibly well until that last 50K. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so walk, walk us through trash. that real quick. People want to hear that. So last 50K, what happened? So last 50K, um, and I don't know if it was a combination of wearing too much compression the whole time. Like, I don't know if I was building up like inflammation, whatever. But anyhow, it was a common, when I went to medics, it was a common, I sw swelled up. It was a common what you want to call it, injury. I was not injuring myself anymore. They told me I could continue on. It was just going to be slower. And where, where was the swelling? Uh, it was lower um, quad knee area. Um, and that was just from the the amount of vertical that we were doing. Um, and they they see it a lot there in, that, right. in this race. And so basically um, I was doing very well until that last 50k and I still ended up doing quite well but um yeah I ended up having to walk the downhills backwards when I could because it was less pressure on the quad so, and so how, 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 how far do you think you walked backwards <laughs> totally I don't, I don't <laughs> like know but the last 50k I, it, 
Well, not the whole 50K because yeah. there's certain technical, qu- I couldn't, but like if it was, if I ended up being on a little gravel road or something, I would flip and just kind of walk backwards um, to just to take the pressure off. And I kept, you know, I kept it, band- they they put an ace on it and um, I, I, it was a slugfest, but I was determined to finish um, and, and so- I finished. Walk us through that mindset is here. You've, you've got to the last 50 K you've gone through everything that you've gone on a, the, the hardest course out there. And all of a sudden now you could argue that your race is going the pot. And how, yeah. how did you stay motivated? How did you keep going? Um, I have to say I was probably a little bit sleep deprived since I had only 10 hours of sleep. But it was really difficult to see all these people pass me. I am competitive, but I'm competitive to myself more so than um, anything. I'm not really competitive to others, but just it was that was probably the most mental being tired and just seeing everybody like enjoy because it was the last 50K. And I know that sounds like, but in this big of a race, 50K seemed like a mile. Um, But for me, it seemed like my entire race again in one chunk of 50k and i just never said no i mean in my brain i never went to the place of i'm gonna stop once i knew i wasn't hurting myself i didn't want to hurt myself but once i knew i was okay to continue i was going to find any in every way whether i was going to crawl i was going to finish this race i didn't let i didn't let myself say stop right all right yeah, so i mean yeah i love that yeah and yeah, and yeah you're not giving yourself that option I didn't um, give it at all. Yeah. Not once. Yeah. Not so, once. Um, you mentioned yeah. sleep. Walk us through your sleep strategy. Um, so again, we're well, talking this, 150 hours, right? Of 150 hours. It was kind of cool. If you read race, race sports, um, everybody's going to hallucinate. So I think that was my, <laughs> I was waiting. I was like, oh my God, am I going to hallucinate? And I mean, pretty much everybody hallucinates. And yes, I did hallucinate. I, it was more earlier in the race. I thought it was going to be later in the race, but it was earlier in the race. And I kept thinking I had a line of people behind me and it happens at night. And I kept telling people to pass me. And I was with one other runner. <laughs> this other runner thought I was absolutely crazy because she's like, there's nobody behind us. And I'm like, yeah, let them pass, let them pass. And then, you know, you think bushes are signs and people cheering you. And I mean, it was wild. But um, besides it went away. And the sleep strategy, I did a lot of research on when people slept and how they slept and why they slept. And I mean, some people have done this race on two hours of sleep. Um, It's amazing what your body can do. You just have to stop listening to your brain and know that your body can do more than it can. So you shut the brain off in a way saying, because it's telling you to stop. It's telling you I'm tired. Um, And you had going into the race. what, What was your sleep strategy and how did that change? during the race, if at all? So I really, my biggest sleep strategy was to try to make it to, I, I kind of researched and where like the top runners, where they slept. Um, I kind of tried to want to make it to that place where they slept and avoid, um, there's little tricks, like don't sleep in the big life stations, try to sleep in the huts. Um, and why but, is that? Know, there's, uh, less people. I mean, I sometimes slept in somebody's kitchen and you that nobody spoke English and you would just say you would point to your watch and you would try to say one hour. Let me sleep for one hour. And you would literally lay down with everything on and crash for an hour. And then they would come and wake you up and you just get moving. Did not get comfortable, <laughs> too comfortable. You literally slept. You know, I literally kept everything on. I never took my shoes off. I uh, I did take my pack off, but I never you kept pretty, pretty fully dressed and just so um, was, was there a time it. where it sounds like you decided to sleep when the conditions were best to sleep and the environment you were in was best to sleep was there a time where you had to sleep yes there was one time um and that was towards the end of the race um so I don't, the longest I slept was like a chunk of three hours. And then every other time I try to keep it to just an hour here and there when I needed it. But there was one time when I wasn't allowed to sleep, you were not allowed to sleep on the side of the, our, the course. And I, I was, I was definitely not, not in a good place mentally. And I needed, I just needed to sleep, 
but I was not in a place. So I had a trip, like, I think I had to go like seven miles. And um, this was the coolest experience. I get to this place and the winner of the race. So I was, I had one more day to go. It was last night. I had one more day. I finished the next day. But the winner of the race was at that aid station, this guy. And he came and he walked with me and he helped me. And he told me how good I was doing. And I'm like, I am so tired. I, he, he, he's the one that like, he changed everything. I, I slept for an hour and then I got up and I kept moving. Um, but um, it was really cool. It was that type of race. I mean, this guy was out in the middle of nowhere. He had already finished the race, won it. And that was cheering other racers on deep in the course. Like, yeah. So. And, and would you uh, say if, if people are out there looking to maybe go the 200 mile distance on an easier course, is it the, a better strategy to start thinking, short periods of like a cat nap um frequently. i would say that don't get yeah i would say do not get hooked into i think i have a do not get hooked into staying don't get comfortable basically yeah. Yeah. don't get comfortable i don't care don't get comfortable when any at any point um you you want to sit and you want to once you sit and you sit do it with a purpose everything is sit eat go you know sleep get up go um and I would advise not taking your shoes off. People, I feel like uh, most blisters um, happen when people keep changing their sock shoe. And I know you have to at times and blisters happen. Maybe I'm really lucky. I never get blisters, but I never take my shoes off ever. I never. Um, and I don't know if that. that those it, are great it, points. And, and talk specifically about how you kept yourself moving at the aid stations, which we'll segue in, we'll talk about nutrition next, but talk, kind of paint the picture of what these aid stations are like and how you stayed efficient during the aid stations of keep moving and eating while you're, while you're walking or hiking to, to just not waste time. Yeah. So first of all, like be organized. Like I had a Ziploc for each time I was be able to get something. So if I'm not mentally there, that Ziploc had everything I need to go back into my pack. Um, I didn't want to spend time wasting, like going through a bag and trying to figure out stuff. But I, if I was really hungry, I would sit down and I would eat. Uh, I would eat as much as I could eat. Um, go, we'll go back to training. I mean, that's about nutrition, but training, right. I trained to eat. I would eat a big meal when I trained and I would go out and I would train on a full stomach. I would eat a lot when I did. And then if I wasn't very hungry, I would just shove stuff into my pack and keep walking, knowing I would get hungry in a little bit. Um, but just have, at one okay. point I chub chicken legs. <laughs> 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 I brought, I had, I literally was craving chicken and I literally put like chicken legs in my pack. That's maybe why I don't so have So that's a pack something anymore. that you brought? <laughs> no, I made oh, my husband okay. go find it. Yeah. All right. So. Yeah. What walk us through what nutrition you took to the race and had on you that you brought and also how you supplemented that with the race food that they had. One of my greatest tricks you taught me, um, or you found it, it's called spiz. Um, so at nighttime, when you're really tired, the last thing you want to do is spend energy trying to get um, food. So every night I would have a bottle of the spiz, which is like 500 calories that I would just have to go like that and drink. I didn't even have to pull it out of my pack. So that was 500 calories. That's huge. Um, I would separate goos. I would have my, um, and this is nighttime. Nighttime I did goos in that spiz that I brought. Um, and I would separate caffeine goos from regular goos. And then, um, I would have stuff like that I brought like uh, jerky. I do a lot of kind of jerky, um, something I can suck on. I do ginger sh um, ginger chews. Um, that's something I can suck on. So um, nasty, nasty book plug. You make your own jerky. If you have Born to Run yeah. too, it's Margot's jerky in the recipe yeah. section. All right, carry on. Huh. Yeah, so, um, but have practice it in your pack. So you know exactly where it is, especially at nighttime, because I think 
where people get in trouble in these longer races is they try to push through to the next aid station, which might be miles, and they're going to get themselves in a hole instead of continuing their nutrition through the night. Um, and I think I did that incredibly well. And I think I never had a bonking issue like that in this race or pretty much any race. I'm really. So what was your hourly strategy? Did you, did you, could you remember how many you, calories you really averaged throughout each hour? Uh, so probably, no, I don't know through the hours, but, but I just know that I had, I probably did a thousand calories between that. That's 500 in that drink. And then maybe four or five goos. I did, I did all my caffeine goos at night. Um, but and, you're, but you're still, um, you know, two to 300 an hour, right? Somewhere in that range. Yeah. I just made it very accessible. Don't if you have to pull it out, make it accessible. Yeah. Otherwise so, you're not going to do it. What changed during the day? In the day time, then I, I would, I feel like I ended up um, being at more stations in the day. I mean, if I was there at, I, at night, I really, I don't feel like I was there at night for some reason. I don't know. But um, in the day, then I would eat any food that they had. I knew what they had. Make sure you know the food because if you don't like it, especially if you're in the States, you can get your own food. But um, I knew what the food was and I liked it. Um, it was a lot of pasta. There was a lot of bread. Um, it was a lot of salami. I could eat all of that. Um, so I, I, I tended to eat more of their food and bring a little extra in the day. And then I tended to rely on my stuff at night. You mentioned you train your stomach to be able to run on a full stomach. Um, it, was there, how much did you experiment with, with other foods in training to prepare for maybe what was some of the little bit unknown of what they were going to have at the aid stations? Well, one of my favorite workouts that I remember you gave me was I was at the village and um, you told me to stop at the mid mountain restaurant and eat a piece of pizza and then continue on. And then on the way back down, eat again, and then come back down. And that was great because it forced me to stop, which I don't like to do necessarily and eat. Um, and sometimes you just, you really do need to eat. Um, and especially in these longer races. And so, um, and then in the, like, I wouldn't do it on a fast sprinting day. I would not, you know, put, put myself on a full stomach, but, um, if I was doing any type of, you know, simulating training, I would eat big breakfasts. I would, I would literally try to eat anything and then work out, run, yeah, right, walk, right. hike. Right. And it, it's just like training. You, you, you gained more confidence and your, your stomach got better and better at running on a yeah. full stomach, which is the key. Is that something that we can train? Another trick, um, ginger crystals. If you um, do get an upset stomach, they make these little packets of ginger crystals. They're easy to carry. You just put them in water. It can be hot or cold. And it really does help, um, you know, soothe your stomach. But don't, what is the advice when you, because you always tell me. Yeah, you so. Know, well, did you eat? Yeah, the kind of the common cardinal rule is if the, if the heart rate gets really, really low, obviously you need to eat. Mo most of the time, I'll, I'll say it this way, is that 10 times out of 10, when we start feeling like we're lacking strength, it's lack of fuel. It's, it's where you're depleted. And so many athletes confuse that with, oh, I'm just tired and fatigued because of the style of race I'm doing. And that's, that's really very rarely the case is that most times if you've done your training, you find yourself dragging and fatigued later in the race. If you eat, you're, that's going to turn around in 10 minutes and you're going to feel like a champion. And it, it's, it's just kind of going through that in training, almost kind of um, going through a bonk in training can be some of the, the most beneficial things you can do to know that you can pull yourself out of that. I, I tell my athletes, whenever, whenever you're feeling bad, eat. sounds counterintuitive yeah. because the last <laughs> thing you want to do is eat. But the most th thing you should do is to eat. And that's where it gets tricky. I would say another advice you give is training your weaknesses, whether it's 
something physical like downhill or uphill or whatever, but it's also um, people like eating or a lot of people don't want to stop um, to put coat on because they just don't. And, and that, that, I mean, that could take you out of a race, to be honest with you. Or if you get like a rock in your shoe, you're like, oh, I'll just wait to the next aid station. Well, then your foot is destroyed by the time you get there. Stop and do the things that you need to do. Um, and that is a weakness of mine. I don't, that's a weak, that was one of my weaknesses is to stop and do the things I needed to do to continue on. Yeah. Great, great point. So to wrap this up, let's, let's dive into shoes and equipment real quick. You know, you, sure. you mentioned um, the the feet and having a stone that kind of is a segue into maybe foot core and just talk about in general, how yeah. important foot strength is for everything that you've done. It is everything people <laughs> read Eric's book. It's everything, literally everything. Um, I, I, I am such a believer and um, advocate of it talk about the real world like why i mean it's one thing to say it what 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 convinced you what what did it do for you well it it truly is the beginning of the strength of my legs um i was less injured i mean my freak injury at the end of this race was not because of my feet strength your stability you know you have less hip issues you have less back issues you have less you can hold your form longer um, you feel, I like, I started with Eric with orthotics and these high shoes. Now I wear low drop minimal shoes. I love to feel the, um, I like to feel the rocks. I like to, not, not, not poking, but I like to, my feet to wrap around rocks and stuff like that. Um, and that's something that can be trained, right? People don't realize that we, we can come down and shoe height and still oh. have the protection we need because of our foot strength. So talk Absolutely. to us. Everybody loves shoes. What shoes did you use for the race? Yeah, so uh, I have it here. Saucony yeah. Peregrine. It has dirt in it right now, but um, <laughs> I think it has, uh, I do think it has a rock plate. Yeah, it's but, a rock plate um, and it's a four mil drop. So four mil drop. That's, that's not much a of a off. shoe. Didn't I take the shoe off for five days? Um, holds up well, and they're not that expensive. I mean, it was a great shoe. I mean, I it it was great on slippery rocks. It was great on um, because the last day it snowed. Um, I had no problem with slip slipping. It, it's a good shoe. Yeah, I liked it. That's Point being shoe. is, again, it's four mil drop. It's close to the ground. It gives her the protection she need, but that came through training and her ability to have good foot strike, foot strength. And to come down and not have to wear a super high platform shoe that would have taken all her proprioception and feel of the rock away. Right. Um, another one of my little tricks is these little uh, $3 gloves that you get in, at the store because everybody, you know, your hands get cold at night and stuff in these longer races. I don't care if you're in the desert, you're going to get cold. You could pitch them, throw them away. Um, they're three bucks. Don't you, you know, they're light. They, they, um, they're the best. I, that's all I use now is these little stupid three out three dollar gloves at the grocery store. Um, I always have a good windbreaker. I use the Houdini, the Patagonia Houdini. Yeah. So um, talk to us, what was in your pack aside from nutrition? You know, what, what did you have to carry and what, what, what size pack did you use? What was it? What's it? It's a Mont Montaigne. Mont Montaigne, yeah. So why did you yeah, like? Mon to... Yeah, she, so, she chose the Montaigne pack. I believe it was the either twelve or fifteen liter. But so why? Why did you like pretty, that? Yeah. So this is the lesser of the pack, but it, I, you're not gonna be able to see it. But it has a Velcro bottom, which is way more comfortable. Um, for example, you know that pack lived on me for five days, and um, when I finished the race, the first thing my husband wanted to do is take my pack off. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I made him, I walked home with my pack on because I was so comfortable in my pack. Um, so Montaigne makes a great pack for long distance. And that, that strap, this is, this is another, there you, yeah, there you, you can, can see, see it better. The smack, it runs down below and it's nice and wide. Yeah. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't cut into you. Fit without inhibiting your breathing. Yeah, and it doesn't cut in. 
very lightweight um, rain pants, rain jacket, hat, gloves. Um, then that's all mandatory gear, right? You know, so this that's is all like, yeah, standard, yeah, yeah, it's all mandatory and, and headlamps. I, I use batteries. I don't use the rechargeable. I would use a rechargeable if I had a shorter race in right. this race um, in Europe. I just wanted to replace batteries. Um, always extra rip batteries. I always had two headlamps with me, one kind of a cheapo and one a good one um, because that's, you can't be out there without a headlamp. Um, did you use a, a flashlight in your hand or just your headlamp? No, just headlamp. Cause I always had my poles. Oh, and then the lake, I use these poles, um, that have a hand, you know, yep. and you can unclip them. Yep. And I love that. So you just kept the hand thing on. It didn't right. bother me. I used them the entire time. So yeah, I love, I love poles. I'm a big advocate of poles. If you can use a pole in a, in a very, in a vertical, I used poles in Madagascar, totally flat okay. and used them. So. All right. So I want to end real quickly with, we talked about real quickly, the difference between maybe some U S races, styles of races in Europe. And you mentioned that in Europe, specifically this race and, and UTMB style races, there are no pacers. Can you just real quickly walk us through maybe the pros and cons of having a pacer and not having a pacer? I think not having a pacer, you're more in tune to the race. I have paced a lot of people in races, in the bigger races, and um, they become very dependent on you. And I think they kind of lose sight of their own race. I think when you're when you have to depend just on yourself, you um, you're just a little bit more efficient, and you're you're not you're not careless. You're you have to you have you know kind of be on it the whole time. Um, and I really love that style. I like to be self sufficient, um, but I can see where some people might need the motivation. I did not need the motivation of another person um, or the company. I like to be out there by myself. I like, actually, I really like be by myself. I don't listen to music. I just like to be there. I prefer that style, but. So it's really kind of diving into understanding your own personality and doing what's best for what you know is good for you and not kind of just falling into what everybody does. And I think that's the case. Would, yeah. I would also make sure if you do have a pacer, make sure they're aware of your style. Like you don't start to do their style because they're fresh. You're not fresh. Um, wow. So it's very important for the pacer, your pacers to understand. And let's say you have a problem eating, make sure your pacer knows that. So you, they maybe can get you to keep eating um, things like that. Like, um, well, and what I tell my athletes is, is it, it's huge for you to realize what you need to hear from a pacer when things go bad. Some people, they like humor. Some people like the hard, the hard approach of kicking you in the butt and, and yelling at you. Other people, they need to be quiet. So it's really, really, I think, important for you to dive into reflecting on what you need when things go bad at a race and then relay that to your pacers of, okay, hey, I respond best this way and I, re I don't respond at all this way. And, and, no, and, and I'll do that before. Like, yeah. Right. Exactly. Before exactly. Yeah. During your, <laughs> during your pre-race meeting with your pacers and crew. Absolutely. Yep. So um, yeah. great. Well, I think that's a great way to end this. This was awesome. Um, the good first one. And like I mentioned at the start, throw down your questions again, that lets us get in your head, your mindset, see what you're thinking. And that'll help us kind of come up with topics for future episodes for the deep dive of the cool and possible. So Thanks, Margo. Good first one. Thank and uh, we'll see everybody next time. Thanks. And what would you say to someone who maybe is concerned about getting older as an athlete and maybe slowing down or don't think that they can achieve something as they got older, but you had your ultimate race at 51? What would you say to that person? I would say to that person, don't worry about like slowing down. Again, it's a mindset. It's not about age. It's about what you want to do and just figuring out a way to do it. If you want it, go do it. Keep evolving.